Thank you, LMU alumni, for joining us in solidarity for a meaningful program with some of our Black alumni, a program meant to inspire action, advocacy, and also further conversation in our homes and in our communities. This is a real time of reckoning for our country. It's a time of reflection and action. And the fact that you chose to join us today says quite a bit about you and uh, about our community as we take steps for better equity literacy. My name is Ernesto Colin. I am a two-time alumnus of LMU, class of 99 and 01. I now serve as an associate professor of teaching and learning at LMU. Before I go on, I wish to acknowledge, even though we are in cyberspace tonight, LMU is located on the ancestral territory of the Tongva peoples, and I wish to thank them and their ancestors for being the original caretakers of this land. Tonight's LMU Solidarity Hour has been a partnership between LMU's Alumni Association and the Office of Intercultural Affairs. I want to thank all of the people who made tonight possible. We're recording and live streaming tonight's program on Facebook. Fans of the LMU Alumni Association page may use the comments feature if you want to ask questions or post comments. Uh, we'll, we'll be monitoring the chat and maybe some of you um, will have comments featured in July's alumni newsletter. So take advantage of those tools. I'm really excited for tonight. We have some incredible speakers lined up. Uh, in addition to three Black alumni from different decades uh, who will share their journeys with us, we have my colleague, uh, the esteemed Dr. Cheryl Grills, uh, LMU psychology professor, who will set the tone for our program by bringing, uh, bringing in, into our program context and history for this moment and for this movement that we're living. And finally, we're lucky to have uh, LMU President Tim Snyder to close our program. He'll share with us some of the specific pathways uh, our university is taking to address systemic, systemic oppression and anti-Black racism in a more comprehensive manner. Uh, but first, to begin our program, I'd like to welcome the Dean of LMU's College of Communication and Fine Arts, Bryant Alexander, who will provide an opening prayer. My thoughts for today are threefold. First, I welcome you to this sacred space. Yes, <laughs> sacred. For while this Zoom environment is not a church, chapel, synagogue, or mosque, it is a practiced place that comes into its sacredness when people of common commitment gather to confirm what they believe and then engage in reflection and critical planning on being and becoming better, better at enacting their commitments to the greater and common good, better at realizing our faults and foibles without shaming, but calling each other to attend to the work of emancipating our minds in order to empower acts of social justice. So by our co-presence, and our commitment, this Zoom gallery has become sacred space. Hence, we need to be spiritually minded of each other's presence. Second, my hope for us today is simple, but it might be the most difficult thing that many of us ever do. And that is for us to truly build a spiritual communion across our diverse cosmologies of knowing each other and come to understand that while we are currently together alone, we are never alone when we are together. And thus we may become the change that we wish to see in the world. Third and finally, there are many Bibles and spiritual texts in my home. Today, I read from the book of Langston, Langston Hughes, that is, and offer a poem as a prayer. Daybreak in Alabama. When I get to be a composer, I'm going to write me some music about daybreak in Alabama. 
and I'm gonna put the purest songs in it, rising out of the ground like a swamp mist and falling out of heaven like soft dew. I'm gonna put some tall, tall trees in it and the scent of pine needles and the smell of red clay after rain and long red necks and poppy colored faces and big brown arms and the field daisy eyes of black and white, black, white, black people. And I'm gonna put white hands and black hands and brown and yellow hands and red clay earth hands in it, touching everybody with kind fingers, touching each other natural as do in that dawn of music, when I get to be a composer and write about daybreak in Alabama. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Dean Alexander. Uh, indeed, a sacred space tonight, a, a space for emancipation. We're here together and we'll work to bring a break of day after this long night. Thank you so much. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Cheryl Grills, a clinical psychologist with an emphasis in community psychology and a professor of psychology in LMU's Bellarmine College of Liberal Arts. Dr. Grills. Thank you. Good evening, LMU family. I'm going to share my screen with you and try to provide a little bit of context for what we're doing here today. So the assaults to black folks' dignity and humanity just keep coming. The hits keep coming and we keep trying to adjust ourselves in the midst of all of the assaults. As a result, however, black folks are legitimately tired. We're frustrated, we're skeptically hopeful and we're always resilient. And as you look at this little image here, this little young man saying, stop killing us, I'm sure that what comes to mind for you is the police brutality. But I want to say that it's not just the police. Every system that touches our children harms them and that scares us to no end. When we look at what this society does, there's priming, stereotyping, implicit bias constantly at play. Here you see an image from, two images from Katrina, Hurricane Katrina. But when the black person is trying to survive, he's looting. But when the white folks are trying to survive, they're finding. When you see images on the news, burglary charges pending for three University of Iowa wrestlers, they're in their Sunday best. Burglar, burglary by four um, uh, men in Coralville, you get their mugshots. Those are things that are sealing the deal to continue the, ne the negative images and stereotypes of who we are. And the assaults to our identity and our dignity begins very early in our life. This is an image from a um, workbook that I saw in New Haven, Connecticut a few years ago when I was doing some emotional emancipation circle training and it broke my heart because it's already training our children, all children on how to see us. You see that this is just to learn penmanship, but the messaging is there. The happy, black, the happy white girl, the proud white boy, the sad black boy, the angry black girl. So we're talking about unmitigated racial stress from the time we were forced to be here in enslavement to children simply trying to be at a pool party or children simply trying to go to school. It's psychic suffocation and trauma. And it's not just against white, I mean, black folks, it's actually against people of color. Because if you look in the upper right frame, you'll see the Latinx community protesting against the indignities and assaults to their humanity. So we're talking about terrorism by another name and history matters. Are we paying attention? Zora Neale Hurston said the present was an egg laid by the past that had the future inside its shell. 
And worse than that, there's no agony like bearing an untold story inside of you, which is our reality, the black reality in the United States and in the world. And so why are we tired? Why are we skeptical? Well, let's start with this image of this young man, 14 year old George Stinney Jr. The only child in American history to ever be executed. His little frame was so small, they had difficulty strapping him in to electrocute him. Why could a society electrocute a black child? Because they don't see us as human and they don't respect our humanity. And so we're tired because look at all of these constitutional amendments. Look at all these congressional bills. Look at all of these executive orders and federal court decisions. And after all of these efforts specifically directed at the rights and the protection of black people in this country, we are still at the bottom of every good list and the top of every bad list. And so we've marched, litigated, legislated, prayed, but our gains keep getting undercut. The attacks keep coming. The question is why? It's because of a deadly mindset that since the days of our enslavement and before, actually it's 600 years long, that mindset sees black people as less than human. And so the basic premise of what we're dealing with, the fundamental structure of racial oppression is violence. That violence includes psychological violence and it places our very souls under stress and compromises all aspects of health and it takes our breath away. So we're talking about prolonged after suffering. While, that is our normal while, stress and prolonged shine. suffering. I want you to look at the images you see after here. Look while, at that child. Look at that elder. It won't hurt you after a while. But for now, it, uh, it is hurting it us. It won't hurt after a while. Mm -hmm. And as one of our Stop alums, Tiana Adams, said in 2015 at a conference, she said, the struggle to be is a source of stress for Black folk. And so if you look here, these are some alternate images. And it brings a very different feel to it, right? So what's going on here? It's sunshine. It's seeing black folks when we are allowed to be human, we are when we are allowed to be the fullness of who we are. But racism is like shade on our resilience. Why can we not have sunshine? Why is the question I have not found the answer to. So you got to go through it to get to it. Black folk, if the rest of the world does not see me, I see myself. We have to see ourselves no matter what other people say about who we are. And how and why is this relevant? As people of African ancestry, we have had to deal with generations of racism, stereotypes, mistreatment, and discrimination, and it takes our breath away and our health, our image of ourselves and each other. Baldwin said people are trapped in history and history is trapped in them. We in the Association of Black Psychologists and Community Healing Network say it's time to plot our escape. And this is what we look like when we're escaping. We're doing the hard work of emotional emancipation. These are brothers that are trained in Omaha, Nebraska, right up the road from where Mal uh, Mar yeah, Malcolm X, his home, is still there. And this is what we look like after a racial healing session, a renewed mindset, renewed individual narratives, renewed collective narrative, free of the lie driven by the truth. So there are several premises to this movement for emancipation, including that we are trapped in the European version of history rooted in the lie of white superiority and black inferiority. And in order to escape and create a narrative of our own grounded in our humanity, we have to go through a process of emotional emancipation. But guess what? 
everybody has been infected by these lies. No one in our society has escaped. So we all have work to do. And we can all draw on our cultural principles and values. They hold the keys to our emancipation. But just to help you really begin to appreciate how daunting and how deep-seated this issue is, I want to ask you, do you remember? For my African-American and Black alum here with us today, when was the first time you realized you were Black? Think about that. When was the last time, or when was the first time, I'm sorry, that you realized you were Black? Ponder that for a second. Unfortunately, I've done this exercise so many times, I know what the answers are going to be like. They're painful, they're deep-seated, the scars are still there, and so when people start describing it, it's as though it's happening right now. And guess what? Most of the stories go back to childhood, and then they just keep building on top of that. But also, when was the first time you realized you were Latinx? or Asian Pacific Islander, or Native American indigenous, or different on a dimension that is central to who you are. Tap into that and use that as a bridge to connect to what is going on for the Black community in your midst. So let me start to conclude. We are under immense threat and racial stress, anti-Black cultural, economic, environmental stress, and more. And in the midst of that, when we go into PWIs, when we go into predominantly white spaces, and even when we're in predominantly black space, we have to do regular de-blackening in order to be accepted, in order to advance, in order to be protected and not harmed. But the problem is, as Baldwin said, the American ideal of progress is measured by how fast I become white and we will never become white. So de-blackening, doesn't get us anywhere except heartache. And what are the institutions, policies, practices that de-blacken Black folks, that take Latinx folks out of their sense of authenticity or Native Americans or Asian Pacific Islanders? So I suggest we take, when we're talking about trying to understand and connect and be an ally with Black folk in this time, that we take an aerial Wakandan view. Yes, Wakanda forever. You can't understand or address our concerns or be an ally or a bridge looking at us from your lens. You have to have an aerial view, see the big picture and see it from our perspective. And all kinds of stuff matters when you start doing that, right? And without understanding some of these things, we end up with answers that don't answer, explanations that don't explain, and conclusions that don't conclude. And realize, Black eyes realize real lies. And we also realize that we have a very broken social contract. So what we do depends on what we see, right? I say no. What we do depends on what we are socialized and trained to see. Understand that. And that's part of the work of the emancipation we have to do because we often don't see each other. We see through the lens of our biases and your perspective plus the perspective of others matters. Both perspectives matter. For one man, yay, there's a boat. And for another man, yay, there's land. And as Alan DeGeneres said, sometimes you can't see yourself clearly until you see yourself through the eyes of others. So, okay, America, in the spirit of Dr. King, you always wanna bring him up, what you gonna do? Diversity is the mix. Inclusion is getting the mix to work well together. Equity and justice is what makes it real and sustainable. So we're in a racialized society that compromises all of our identity. It compromises people of color self-determination and, and it compromises the social contract. And it compromises not just Black folk, compromises white folks, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, the Latinx community, the indigenous community. It compromises American society. I want you to look at that image there and look at what those signs are saying. 
That mindset, that's not the past. That's with us today. Native Americans forced into assimilation, taken, children taken from their families. The Latinx community faced all manner of assaults to their humanity and their dignity. Asian Pacific Islanders are mm -hmm. also assaults to who they are. And don't get fooled by that my, my model minority myth. It is harmful and it hurts. And as, she, as he says, it's a trap, just like any other stereotype. So, well, where do we go from here, says Dr. King? Chaos or community? We've got tools that we can draw on. We've got courageous conversations that require being engaged, experiencing discomfort, speaking our truth, accepting, expecting and accepting non-closure. And we need to educate ourselves, read, question, seek to understand, be mindful and reflect, take risks, take action, become aware, read some more. This is a process, not a destination. And we have other tools like the Kerwin Institute, six principles for civic engagement. It took us generations to get here. We can't wait generations for it to end. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Grills. Your call could not be more clear. Uh, where do we go? Well, we have to go in another direction. It's racism, anti-Blackness, white supremacy, it's unsustainable. And uh, you've made a call to consciousness, to solidarity, and for all of us to be co-conspirators in the disruption of the multiple forms of violence and the multiple indignities that, that uh, folks have endured and to help heal. So thank you so much for your, for your words tonight. We'll transition tonight to hear from our alumni speakers. The, our first speaker is Jerome Carter, class of 1986. Jerome is the CEO and founder of Inspiration 52 Incorporated. It's a consulting business that provides motivational training for students and for educators. He works with lots of school districts. Uh, Jerome is an expert in teacher and student motivation. Um, and among other things, a poet and uh, an instructor for us at LMU. Known him for a long time. Glad he's with us tonight. Jerome, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ernesto. And thank you uh, to the Solidarity team and anyone who's had anything to do with me being a part of the discussion tonight. And thank you, Dr. Grills, for that incredible presentation. And as, um, as I just reflect on my years at LMU, I, I graduated a high school, Manuarts High School, which is in the inner city of Los Angeles. I graduated in 1982, uh, coming from a high school that's uh, predominantly black, 90% black, and then coming to a university that was 90% white. Uh, so it was a, a culture shock for me, uh, but I'm, I was thankful to, <clears throat> to meet some really nice people at LMU of all colors, get plugged in with the BSU, get plugged in with the African-American Support Services. The, the late, great um, Dr. John Davis was my instructor um, with African-American Studies. So I found out a lot about myself at LMU. I lived on campus all four years, had, had four of the best years of my life there at LMU. And uh, so I'm, I'm really grateful and thankful just to share my experiences, but there, there were some things that, that took place at LMU. For me on a spiritual level, uh, number one, I rededicated my life to Christ. Uh, I attended church with, with students off campus. I attended the retreats with LMU, which were incredible. Uh, I remember um, some of the leadership retreats with African-American support services with METRA, which was the Mexican-American Chicano studies, uh, Asian Pacific Islanders, and we would all go there and talk about some of the things, same things we're talking about now. Um, I remember going on the BSU retreats. I was black student. I was the, the uh, president of the BSU uh, my sophomore year, and we would have our retreats, and and it brought in a spiritual aspect and our our solidarity at LMU through um, through Jesus Christ, which which really stuck with me, which transcended color, which really helped the foundation. Uh, of who I am today, and I'm really grateful 
uh, for all those things that have taken place uh, at LMU and helped uh, me to be uh, the man that I am today. And so I, as, as I just look over my life at LMU and my notes, the things that, as I already stated, which really helped me was the, the solidarity through my, my faith in Christ, which is a foundation which, which can't be shaken. Um, and, and oftentimes we do look for, and, and we need to look for solutions. And oftentimes we look for natural solutions to a, to a spiritual problem. And what I mean by that is until we get to the, the heart of mankind uh, and, and the systemic sin that causes all the oppression, until we, until we get to the heart of mankind, and, and because it's no reason for, for me to look at Ernesto or, or Dr. Alexander, or Dr. Grills, or anyone, or, or President Snyder, to see them less than anything but the best of God's handiwork. And, and anybody that doesn't see their fellow human like that, that's a problem. And implicit biases and, and the things that we work on in, in education, it's we got to get to the heart of man um, and to help really. So we're, we're, what, am I, what am I saying? I'm saying we're preaching, um, um, uh, we're praying, and we're protesting, and all three go together. And, and then it has to be motivated by love, the love of the greatest example, which was the light of the world, which was Jesus Christ. It has to be motivated by love through the power of God's Holy Spirit, the love, the peace, the joy, the goodness, the faithfulness, the kindness. If I do anything, Ernesto, and it's not motivated by love, alumni, then I'm just making a lot of noise. I teach school. I train teachers because I love them. And I train teachers to watch out for their implicit biases. And if they're not ready to go into that classroom and understand the funds of knowledge that those kids bring and their parents and that community bring, then you need to go somewhere else. And so it's important that we, with the training, that we're training that heart, we're training that mind, uh, we're training that spirit. So I don't see any kid or any person as less than God's best. Um, two life-changing events, and then I'll, I'll kind of go ahead and wrap this up for me. Uh, I've had the, the privilege of studying all around the world, but two life-changing events was when I was uh, studying in Israel and I went inside the empty tomb of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and just the power of that, of the resurrection, as I'm researching the resurrection, because if the resurrection didn't, didn't happen, then, then none of this is, is, is worth anything. Um, but going inside that empty tomb has changed my life. And then spending time with my, my Christian Jewish brothers and sisters, and then went over to Egypt and studied in Egypt. And so I'm sitting down with my Egyptian brothers and sisters, and they're showing me their tattoos of the, the cross on their right in between their finger right here and telling me how St. Mark came to Egypt in 32 AD and preached the gospel. And in the fourth century, they were officially a Christian nation. And sometimes we see we've been taught history that says Christianity started with slavery, but it was already in Africa. It was already in Ethiopia. It was already in Egypt. And so we get a bias even on based on religion. But when you go there and you study and you're sitting with them and they're asking you, how do you feel being in Egypt? I said, I'm home. I'm at the motherland. And to find out that Christianity was here in 32 AD and officially in, in the fourth century. And, and so it... It, it blew my mind, but as Dr. Grill, Grill shared, just the, the biases that we get in, in our, our American education from kindergarten and, and the, the stereotypes, and then the, what was it? Real eyes, real eyes, real lies. Um, it's unfortunate and we do a disservice uh, to our youth by not teaching them to, to, to see um, everyone as the best that God created. Man, it is a beautiful thing when you look at that lens. And then when we do all the work, then it then you're transforming hearts and minds through the power of Christ, motivated by love through the power of the Holy Spirit. And 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 that's my prayer is we're out protesting and we're preaching and we're praying and it's all together that we'll see a change and we have to get to the heart of mankind because uh, if, until we touch the heart of mankind, um, it, we're just putting a mask on it and it's always like it has been covered up with nice suits and nice words, but no internal change. A heart needs to be transformed. Now, I'm not talking about organized religion that's oppressed people. I'm talking about a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ that transformed hearts. So I see nothing but the best in my brothers and sisters, regardless of color or where they've come from.
thank you for allowing me to share my two cents. Oh, thank you, Jerome, for modeling and for highlighting how the synergies of our campus and the values of LMU can be foundational for our work, wherever that may be. You've done that. Thank you so much. Next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Yoshido Lang from the class of 2000. Yoshido is a licensed clinical psychologist. Uh, he provides crisis intervention counseling services and assessments for both adults and children. Dr. Lang is the former president of the Southern California chapter of the Association of Black Psychologists. I'd like to welcome him uh, to the floor tonight. Thank you, Ernesto. Thank you for this opportunity. My time at LMU was impactful. I graduated from Davis Star Jordan High School in Long Beach. I grew up in a single parent home with my mom. So just like Jerome was saying, coming to LMU was a culture shock for me. It's amazing to see the world as different, just driving 35, 45 minutes down the freeway. But like most of you, LMU has a special place in my heart. While there, I learned a great deal about myself and others. As I think about the current events that's going on, LMU was a microcosm of the larger society that we lived in. As a work study student, I worked in admissions with Charles Mason. We focused on the recruitment and retention of African-American students. While working with Charles, I saw how he navigated LMU tireless, tirelessly working for black students to have an education at our university. While there I also was one of the founding members of the Brothers of Consciousness, myself and five other, five other guys, we had the opportunity and thought it was very important to build a safe space for black males on campus, wanting to focus on service and community building. It's great to see that the organization is still thriving today. But you know, Loyola was not immune to what's taking place in our nation. Loyola has its own history of injustice and inequality. During my tenure on campus, there was racial tension. There were instances where students were called out of their names. There were times in which we had sit-ins on campus advocating for African-American studies and various programs promoting diversity and intercultural affairs. As a psychology major, I interned with Dr. Grills, who you heard from earlier, and I got the chance to see firsthand the principles and practices of community psychology. I was a part of a research and program evaluation team that worked with organizations such as the Community Coalition in South LA. We engaged in projects led by youth and members of the community, advocating for healthier food options in their neighborhoods. We even looked at defining health in local housing apartments in Watts, like the Jordan Downs Housing Project. But my journey and commitment to servicing my community didn't end there. I was a part of the initial formulation of what would become known as the African American Alumni Association. Together with the support of the administration, we looked to strengthen our presence, not only on the campus, but beyond the bluff. My experience at LMU was life-changing indeed. It was there where I met the love of my life, Tamika, class of 2001. We've been married for 14 years now and have two beautiful and <laughs> rambunctious kids. It was also at LMU I got the chance to study abroad in Ghana. To set foot on the African soil and to be in the land of my ancestors was a powerful experience. To go to the dungeons and sit in the very cells where people would rather fight, starve, or die and take part in what was only the beginning of a dehumanizing experience. To smell the stench of urine and feces remain in the room, in the small rooms where hundreds were kept like chattel. To actually crawl through the door of no return where Africans were loaded onto ships, eating sand as a means of taking part of their homeland with them. To even more good parts where seeing people in Ghana like, who look like me, who look like my folks here in the US, what an experience it was for me and for those who had a chance to go and bear witness to such things. But I came back, I came back with a sense of purpose. I came back with a drive and a will to better myself and my community. A sense of determination and an awareness that I am not alone in the struggle for liberation. 
I also saw the grip of the lie of white superiority and how it permeates throughout the world through coloniza colonialization and the enslavement of others. Today, well, today I'm the manifestation of my ancestors' dreams. Today I am a healer working for the well being and the health of people in a system that does not inherently validate them. Today I strive towards the better day, as Frederick Douglass wrote. The better day where my children and their children will walk in the manner where they are not judged by the color of their skin or the content of their care, but the content of their character, as Martin Luther King Jr. said. Today I function in a number of roles as a healer in communities of color. First, I'm a proud husband and father. Second, I'm a clinician. I work in a group practice called the Amada Psychology Center. We provide culturally competent mental health services focusing on people of African descent, providing therapy, psychological testing, health promotion throughout California. I also function as a supervisor in the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health. It's a huge organization that provides mental health services primarily to the underserved. As a supervisor, I take my skills and knowledge to assist my team of clinicians and community workers on how to best work with our population, to lessen the chance of a misdiagnosis that could potentially follow someone throughout their life, to destigmatize mental health and make it more accessible to those who are mistrustful of a system that can very well help you, but yet in the same turn, devalue you at the same time. I often ask myself, if not me, then who? I ask you students and fellow alums, if not you, then who? Who will stand alongside the voiceless? Who will stand with the unheard? Who will stand up to injustice? What we're seeing now is a new day. Not only are the people standing up for themselves, but corporations and businesses are standing up alongside them. LMU is standing up by its word as well. President Snyder has put forth meaningful effort with the intention of creating an environment that is inclusive. It's not just talk, yet there's much more to be done. This is only the beginning and we're going to keep everyone accountable. We have to be ready and willing to, willing to engage in tough conversations that need to take place. We need safe spaces where we can be vulnerable with each other and non-judgmental as we aim to loosen the noose of systemic racism that, and prejudice that permeates throughout this country. To our new students, your journey is just beginning. Make use of the resources that LMU has to offer to find your purpose and live out your dreams. To my fellow alums, let's continue the work, but we've got much more to do. Let's use our resources and our spheres of influence to make change wherever we can. I'm glad to have you all in this fight and I'm glad and honored to be here with us tonight in this hour of solidarity. At Loyola, I gained the skills, tools and confidence to live out my purpose. My experience here at LMU helped shape who I am and my identity, personally and professionally. It's here where I met my wife and started my own family. LMU, you're part of that family. I cannot do this alone. I need you, we need you, we need each other, and we can do this together in love and solidarity. Thank you. Dr. Yoshido, thank you. Uh, we've known each other since our undergrad days. I was a witness uh, and you continue to inspire us all. I stand with you. Uh, you've established a remarkable legacy, and it's just so good to know that you continue this transformative health care, uh, touching the lives of so many people. Thank you for, for being with us tonight. Uh, part of your legacy uh, uh, is reflected in our next speaker. Uh, our last alumni speaker tonight is one of our newest alums from the class of 2020, Ryan Hopkins. Uh, Ryan is a freelance filmmaker. He just earned a degree from LMU School of Film and Television. Ryan was a resident advisor um, as part of the learning community and the head of marketing for the student organization, Brothers of Consciousness. 
who, as you've heard, uh, is doing amazing work these days. So thank you for joining us tonight, Ryan. Thank you, Ernesto. Um, I want to just first start off by thanking uh, everyone for allowing me to come here and speak to you all today. Um, what I wanted to say was during my time at LMU, my, my experiences in the School of Film and Television really helped shape me in the fact that LMU taught me to hone in on my perspective and my voice, and it really gave me confidence as a filmmaker. But I must say that I got my confidence as a storyteller from my dad. You know, because every lesson I've ever been taught in my life has been framed in the form of a story. And it's funny that one of the most important lessons my father has ever taught me is in the power of consistency. His family and his friends, uh, friends of his from childhood who I've met have all spoken to how consistent he has, he's been through his entire life. Like how consistently he pursued my mom since they first, when they first met in fifth grade. Uh, jokingly professing to his other 10-year-old friends that they would be together by Thanksgiving. And funny enough, he was actually right. They did get together on Thanksgiving. He was just 14 years too soon in his predictions. And he also taught me the power of being consistent with your word. Anyone who knows me can attest to the fact that I take my word very seriously because I grew up with someone around me who kept his word 100% of the time without fail. And now, as I'm older and a little less hard-headed, he knows that when he tells me something once, that's usually all I need to listen. But even now, and for as long as I can remember, he has reiterated one lesson to me nearly every time we talk to each other. I know you've heard this before, son. He always prefaces it like that. But when in doubt, do the right thing. And it seems like that's such a simple lesson, but a lot of times the most valuable lessons are the simplest. Because what would my life, your life, those lives around all of us look like if whenever we faced conflict or times of, of adversity, we just chose to do the right thing? whatever that looks like, and no matter how difficult it is. I have seen my friends at protests putting their health on the line because that is the right thing to do. I've seen people on social media educating one another on these issues because that is the right thing to do. I've seen my brothers of BOC rise to the occasion and create a coalition of student organizations at LMU who collectively have raised over $50,000 for organizations who work to benefit the black community because that was the right thing to do. And during these times, I've thought a lot about what the right thing for me to do was. I recently released my junior level film I made at LMU and it's called Roundabout. And I filmed it over a year ago, but I never released it because it never felt finished or ready but something came over me a few weeks ago telling me to release it. It was filmed in my hometown of St. Louis and it speaks to a lot of the fears I've had in my life and how I've run from them as I've come of age, even though I've had a family there supporting me the whole time. The climax of the film is inspired by the time my brother and I were, stopping, were stopped by the police and were never given a reason why outside of we ran your plates and nothing came up, but we wanted to be sure. And saying that out loud, it makes even less sense than it did to me that night. But that time I was sitting there terrified because at that time, it was only my second real encounter with an officer. My first encounter ending with the officer's firearm being pointed at me. So as I sat there with my older sibling, I had three things cross my mind. The first was, what if my mother lost both of her children on the same night? The second was, I just want to hug my mom again. And the third was, but I've done the right thing. You know, I've never met the Breonna Taylors and George Floyds of the world, but I know them. They're me, they're you, 
they're my mom, they're my dad, they're my brother, they're my girlfriend, they're my friends, they're my family, they're us. And what I also know is that George Floyd had children. I know he won't be able to tell them stories anymore. I know he won't be able to keep his word 100% of the time without fail. And I know he won't be able to remind them when in doubt to do the right thing. And I think about my future children, God willing, how will I teach them to be knowing that you can do everything right and still suffer these consequences? How will I teach them to keep their word when those who have sworn to protect and serve don't keep theirs? That's why in these times, I think it is important to work towards helping your community. You must not just exist within a community or be a part of a community, but consistently be working towards bettering it. My goal is that, not that my films entertain people while I hope they do, but my goal is to show kids who look like me that their voice matters, that their perspective is not only worth being heard, but it's valuable as well. These voices matter these communities matter. We must work in ways that better, the, that better our communities, not just ourselves, because the strength comes in working towards a better future that we ourselves may not see, but those after us will. When Michael Brown was murdered, I saw my community in pain. The country shared our pain as well. And for the life of me, the only thing I could think to do was write. When George Floyd was, more, was murdered, I saw a similar community in pain. And the world shared in that pain as well. And the only thing I could think to do was write. And I'd like to share with you what I wrote that night. Sometimes I wonder what a tree would say if it could talk. Would it speak in reverence towards my ancestors whose calloused hands toiled at the ground from which it grew? Would the tree thank them for allowing generations to reap the fruits of their labor? Would it wail in pain for the strange fruit who swung from it their memory of postcard crumpled in the back of your grandmother's drawer? Would its roots solemnly greet the bodies of my peers who have become their fertilizer? If it fell in the woods and no one was around to hear it, who would speak of its pain? Who is to carry the history of these roots that have intermingled with black flesh for generations? Who can uproot these horrors whose grasp clenches stronger each day? If a tree could talk, would it denounce you for being silent? But alas, a mighty tree is just that, a tree. Its bark cannot speak to our pain. Its leaves do not fall as tears for our struggle. Its branches do not crack because it hurts with us and its roots do not wither because it's ashamed of its role. Sometimes I wonder what a tree could say if it would talk, but the tree remains silent for no choice of its own. As I leave you today, I urge you to find your role to help your community and to remember, when in doubt, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, just wanna let you know you matter so much. Your, your storytelling matters so much. Uh, you remind us of the lived reality, uh, the real anxiety and the daily, da the daily calculations of the black community um, as they jog while black, as they shop while black, as they go to school while black, as they live their lives while black in the United States. And that's why we have this movement at this time for black lives, our current movement. I'm so moved by your story. And uh, as we mentioned earlier in the program, this, this evening is uh, an evening to reflect upon our, our possibilities for solidarity. There are so many um, striking current events uh, that are taking place right now, right? From George Floyd to Breonna Taylor to Tony McDade. Um, and, and we can look at so many other instances of violence. And, uh, and so uh, this evening only begins the conversation. There's so much more to discuss, so much more to get into. And we are called to, to continue to do that as a learning community, 
as a community of solidarity to carry forth our, our mission and values. So thank you for calling us to, to that. It makes a, a transition uh, in our program tonight as, I, as I'm pleased to introduce LMU's 16th president, uh, Timothy Law Snyder. Uh, Thank in, you. Okay, uh, just wanted to mention that uh, in 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 a in a letter that you that you shared with the community, doc, uh, Dr. Snyder, on June sixteenth, that you affirmed uh, the university's commitment with our Black students, our faculty, and our staff. You outlined some specific steps the university is going to take. And so I want to thank you for that letter and, and offer you the, uh, the space tonight to share some words. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Colleen. I think each of us owes some thanks to our alumni speakers, Mr. Jerome Carter, Dr. Yoshedo Lang, Mr. Ryan Hopkins for sharing their stories, their experiences and their reflections. Not easy to do. And those were powerful and helpful as instruments for learning. And that's what a university is all about, being that very thing. So we're grateful for the time you have spent with us and also for your honesty. I thank professors Cheryl Grills and Ernesto Colin uh, for being with us and for moderating. Uh, they are persons who very much lend great reputation to LMU as teacher scholars, some of the most now, uh, renowned people in their fields. Another teacher scholar who right now is in the role of Dean, uh, our dear friend, Dean Bryant Alexander, we thank him for his invocation. Uh, he can, uh, Dean Alexander can make us cry probably faster than any living human being. I don't know, Bryant, how you do that, but, but I love you and I really appreciate your being with us tonight as well. I thank all who have gathered here, who have gathered with open hearts, open minds, and with the common goal of how we can be in solidarity with one another, how we can together work toward becoming an anti-racist society. Class of 2020, uh, your alumni journey uh, begins amidst a global pandemic and a revolution, neither of which were expected. One we welcome in terms of its ability to help us change and I know that your LMU education has prepared you for this moment and movement. We've heard from alumni across different generations and what they are doing to further the conversation and to enact meaningful and lasting change, not talk, change. So we look to our newest alumni, of course, and I know you're feeling the weight of this, but we look to you to join us to continue this dialogue and to fight for equality, for justice, for an anti-racist society. Many ask me what LMU is doing to address systemic racism and allow me to walk you through some highlights from my piece Beyond Words, which I shared with our community. Foremost, an LMU education must be unequivocally inclusive and anti-racist. So in my letter last week, I described eight steps that LMU is taking, and I'll walk you through them. Number one, we will increase the diversity and inclusiveness of LMU by holding ourselves to a higher standard of accountability. We will use an equity scorecard to document our progress in terms of recruiting and also retaining black students, faculty, staff, and executive leadership. We also have the same commitment for members of our other underrepresented populations. If you trace the narrative through the convocations that I offer each year, I speak to us creating the world we want to live in. Human creativity will help those here, those to come in the earth itself. And diversity is the font of creativity. For us to be whole as an institution, and to recognize and realize our mission, sort of in the sense of Jerome's a note that each person is born a person of immutable dignity in the image of God, we must be inclusive. Second, we will add inclusive excellence training as part of our work to all our search committees. So in all units for executive leadership and key staff positions. We've been doing this with our faculty, but we wish to expand it. We will accelerate efforts to increase the racial diversity of our governing boards 
and university leadership as part of that initiative. Third, we will assure that our organizational climate and culture are anti-racist, are equitable, are inclusive, with particular attention to anti-Black racism. Fourth, we will increase resources for cross-unit partnerships that will equip students for action and advocacy in the community, as well as increase connection, engagement, and partnership with the Black community in Los Angeles. Fifth, we will launch this fall a three-year initiative to educate our community on systemic oppression and what an anti-racist education and climate entails. Sixth, we will change art and images in our public spaces and buildings to ensure that LMU reflects more inclusive and diverse representations of our shared history and community. Who are we? Who have we been? Seventh, waive the ACT and SAT requirements for applicants all the way through 2022, 2023. We will in the meantime be exploring ways to further um, our access and equity in our admissions process. Um, reasoning behind that is if you look at SAT and income, you find that they are lockstep with one another, as we say in mathematics, monatomic, monatomic, monotonic. I'm losing my math skills. Where if you line up income, family income from top to bottom and then put SAT scores next to them, those two line up from the greatest to the least. Eight, we will take action through accountability and assessment. So our intercultural affairs division, which is led by Vice President Jennifer Abe, will seek close partnership with black faculty, staff, undergraduate and graduate students and alumni leaders as we determine meaningful ways to track and report our progress. So the ways in which our equity scorecards and other instruments work will be guided by not just a VP, but a professional psychologist. And we will not be using off the shelf tools um, unless they are tools that are seen as valuable by members of our black community. Um, second in that number eight, is though our assessment processes will be guided by diverse representation of Black LMU community members, the responsibility of this effort will not fall solely on those members. Every member of the LMU community will be responsible. And this is in recognition of the untold unknown service that underrepresented persons, Black, Brown, even Jesuit in our community is routinely and well performed. If we're going to do this, we need to have everybody involved. As each of us knows, the pathway to justice requires clear goals. It requires renewed, it requires reformed reflection. It requires conversation like we have had tonight. It requires commitment and it requires action. I am honored to be with each of you as we make changes that are solid, changes that are lasting. It is time for America. It is time for all of us. LMU is in. Dr. Colleen, thank you for giving me time in your program. Thanks to each of you. Thank you, President Snyder, for outlining all the steps uh, of action at our university. We will hold each other accountable to them. Uh, they're, they're important first steps. And so uh, a call to everybody that's with us this evening, alumni from across the globe. I'd like to ask you once again to think about what steps we might make in our homes, in ourselves, in our communities uh, to be in solidarity with this movement. Uh, it could be a conversation with somebody or supporting a POC business or a community organization or, or sharing your personal story like the ones that we heard tonight. Um, remember, you can, you can share those stories of your reflections from tonight, from your lived experience, the actions you're taking uh, with, the, with the Alumni Association and we'll, we'll disseminate those. 
submit the stories to alumni at lmu.edu. Um, I also want to take a, a brief moment to thank all of you alumni and others who have been scholarship supporters for our students. Uh, you see evidence here tonight of, of how important uh, student support is in the, in the form of scholarships. Uh, there's two scholarship funds in particular, the African American Alumni Association Scholarship Fund and the Latino Alumni Association uh, Scholarship Fund. The, these funds make accessible the whole person education uh, that, 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 is, that is established at LEVU for so many deserving students. Uh, re and re regardless of their background and, and their ability to pay. So if you're able to support these funds, uh, I, I encourage you to do so, make a big difference. And so many other important initiatives on the campus uh, for, for our students and, uh, from, from, from different walks. Um, and so, uh, you know, Dean, Dean Bryant Alexander opened uh, with, with a, a poem and I would like to offer a closing poem uh, to close our evening. Uh, I was in New Orleans, a magical place uh, in February, and I made it to uh, an art studio called Studio B. Um, and it's a community space for uh, local artist B Mike. And on the walls, he painted a mural uh, of, a, of a poem that that's, has stayed with me and it's become one of my favorites. I found out that the, the poem was originally uh, by, written by B. Richards, who was the author of the text, A Black Woman Speaks. And, um, and I'd like, I, I'll put it on the screen briefly and uh, ask us uh, to, to close with this call um, and, 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 um, and this poem, which is called Today. Today is ours. Let's live it. And love is strong. Let's give it. A song can help. Let's sing it. And peace is dear. Let's bring it. The past is gone. Don't rue it. Our work is here. Let's do it. The world is wrong. Let's right it. The battle is hard. Let's fight it. The road is rough, let's clear it. The future vast, don't fear it. Is faith asleep? Let's wake it, because today is ours, let's take it. And so my gratitude to every, all of the elements that came together to make this uh, evening possible, deep gratitude to everybody who was able to join us and organize this. Thank you all very much for this wonderful evening as we plant seeds for a solidarity future.